one of the things that, that often gets asked when, when we talk about topics like this is just how or what it means when we talk about waste and what does it mean when we talk about waste in a MERS context. And the pallets that we have just around us now that you hopefully can see in the background, they're an example of the type of waste that we as a company are producing, the stuff we have in our warehouses and the stuff that our customers are also dealing with. And I think, you know, from the video there and you were talking about it earlier, circular economy is one of those things that makes waste very tangible for us as a company as an integrator of logistics, working with those reverse flows of waste. But there have been a lot of questions, as I said, coming through on, uh, on the little iPad here. Um, and I want to start with one that is maybe a little bit more personal. Um, someone was asking that the Earth, and you mentioned that the Earth is a special place. What's the most special part of the Earth that you visited or studied? And what has it taught you about our planet? Yeah, but <laughs> that has to be the ocean. <laughs> with my <laughs> background, it has of to course. be the ocean. <laughs> Um, and and the ocean is is fantastic because well actually nature nature we're just realize well nature has always written a, 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 a diary it's mm. it's it's left signs behind of what it's doing but we haven't been able to read them until now and and that's what my research is all about is trying to read the messages that nature has left us so that we can understand the interaction between life and climate that 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 Biodiversity is all about looking at all of the the different the the different organisms. But I have a I had a wonderful I, I have artists on my on my research cruises. And the last research cruise I had, I had this wonderful artist who who was also a poet and she performed a poem for us. And I cannot tell you what the poem was all about. But it hit me in the gut, and it did it because she had used a special technique where she'd started out using all the letters in the alphabet, and then she took letters away and forced herself to only use, to make words that with the remaining letters. And of course, in the beginning, it was very understandable. It was less flowery language, but it was totally understandable. And at the end of the day, when she finished the poem, it was just grunts and noises <laughs> left, and she looked up and said, those were species that disappeared. Oh, yeah. Wow. We've been focusing on identifying the letters, but we don't know the language. And, and so, you know, the ocean for me, and, and I, I actually go into sediment cores and together with Escavillislu try and, with eDNA, try and describe how nature has looked and changed through all these different climate periods. That's the most That's fascinating. Interesting. And I guess it's also that it's that human connection, right? Having someone come in, be able to write a poem about it, to bring out some of those sentiments, some of those feelings about that work. It's fantastic to see. You talked about this connectedness and especially with the planetary boundaries, you know, connecting to each other. How does one boundary being breached affect the others? Um, and, you know, how do we manage some of that interconnectivity? I think on our side, for example, as you mentioned, there's a lot about climate. And we have a very strong decarbonization target. But how do we then kind of look at that interconnectedness of what we're doing on, you know, the new fuels, what impact that might have on biodiversity and so on? Actually, I think this interconnectedness is is really the key to the time that we're living in. Mm -hmm. We've all we, since Newton, we've been describing living and non-living things in the universe, and our whole our whole education system is built up around. Well, there have you have economy over there, and you have geology there, and you have people there, and you have mathematics over there, and the idea is. Or we seem to think the idea is that if we can get all the details right in our own little box and then put them into a big pot, then we'll understand how the earth works. And that's like asking the doctors that you know with their own specialities, all, put everything you know about the brain and everything you know about the heart and the reproduction and the feet and the bones and everything into a pot and stir it, you wouldn't understand a person because it's interactions that are important. And we're not good at studying interactions. We have started in the planetary boundaries in our last paper that came out. We've had three papers out. The last one was in, in September last year. And interestingly, the paper that came out in 2015 in eight years was downloaded 274,000 times. The paper that came out last September has now, after eight months, been downloaded 425,000 times. So this is a, this is a discourse that is is exponentially uh, increasing in in society. But in that paper, we did some modeling work where we looked. We couldn't. We don't really have the metrics to look at climate and biodiversity directly. So we looked at climate and forest area and. We cannot, the, the chances of our reaching the Paris Agreement 
goals unless we stop deforestation are essentially nil. And 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 but we're not speaking about those 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 challenges in the same breath. We have we have the UNFCCC processes over there with climate, and then we have a biodiversity there, and then we have we have pollution over there. We're just going to have to, also in our in our national and and regional and in as much as we have global laws, um, bring these different challenges together because the interactions are so extreme. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's also what we're seeing with a lot of the interactions that we have around the world, that interconnectedness of, well, in our case, it's going to be supply chains, but it, it mirrors over to the environment, to biodiversity, to the planetary boundaries. So that interconnectedness is something that we're seeing reflected, I think, a lot in, in the way that we interact with the world. It's really interesting to me, this business, because, it, you know, the biodiversity crisis must be just as important as the climate crisis, given that it's, this, it's been this interaction between the two yeah. for three and a half billion years. And yet... People, I, I actually heard an editor in Denmark the other day of one of the big papers say, climate change, that's a question of life and death. Biodiversity crisis, that's a question of aesthetics. What? No, it's not a question of aesthetics. It's, you know, I mean, to me, the biodiversity crisis is, is more concerning than the climate crisis because when we get our control over our emissions, and I say when because we do have the technologies that we need to do it, but when we get control over our emissions, it'll take thousands of years, but the energy balance of the Earth will go back to one that doesn't have a human fingerprint. But every time we lose a species, it's gone forever. So uh, it, that scares me. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those questions of, and I think speaking to that, we have solutions in place. And I think that's also what we're seeing with a lot of the work that we do on the climate side, that we have those solutions there. It's a matter of now implementing them. I think that biodiversity question, and some of the other planetary boundaries are ones that we need to try and see how do we further in the discourse? How do we bring that more to light, make that more of a prominent thing in the way that we work? And actually on that question, there's someone who asked a very good, very, very good question from the audience where we as Maersk, we practice many, I'm going to call them green initiatives for simplification, you know, around reducing CO2, recycling, reducing the use of goods and so on. But given the need of the hour, I love that phrasing, what initiative do you think is the best to have a positive impact on Mother Earth as a whole? Where should we be placing a lot of our efforts? Well... I mean, first of all, companies can't do it on their own. I think companies are incredibly important because it's actually companies that are sitting with their hands on the levers that make a difference because it's how much do we take out, how much raw material do we take out, and what waste are we putting back in. And it's it's companies. It's, it's you know, it's obviously, it's companies that are providing us with energy, food, uh, resor uh, 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 materials for infrastructure and for consumerism and all that sort of stuff. So we're demanding it but it's companies that are doing it and it so it's companies that have their hands right on uh, right on the arrows there so companies are very very important I think societies need the first thing societies need to do is to change their laws that the laws need to incorporate climate and biodiversity into everything so mm. instead of having a ministry for environment, which is lower ranked than the ministry for business, we have to have environment incorporated in all, into all business activities. So that's the first thing for society. For a company like Mask, I think it's important to have metrics and to report against those metrics in the same way that you do against, uh, against your economic metrics. Mm. Now, we do have climate, and people say that climate is much easier than, than, than biodiversity because biodiversity is so complex. Believe me, climate is complex. It's not just about CO2 or other gases. It's about the sun's or, or the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's about sunspots. It's about aerosols in the atmosphere. It's about albedo. It's really complicated. But it's been possible to take a deep breath and say, for the purposes of accounting and being a part of, we can say, CO2 or CO2 equivalents. People understand that. The accountant in the, understands that. The biodiversity people are still saying, oh, 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 there's nothing, oh, it's too complicated. And, and in fact, it is very complicated. But I think just like climate, we can look at the global level. And at the global level, at least on the terrestrial part, the land part, it's use of land. 
because it's use of land that's taking habitat away. It's also reducing the amount of photosynthesis taking place. Photosynthesis is what puts energy into. And we are removing a third a third of the energy that nature had available to it at the time of the Industrial Revolution. We take it out to make these, <laughs> to eat, to... So, so that is our biggest global impact. Now, there are also local impacts, and I'm not saying they're not important, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be worrying about them. But for the accountant who's trying to do the yearly report, I think looking at CO2 and looking at land area that's used in the in the value chain or or biomass whatever is mm. uh, i think that is that's going to be the way forward yeah. again local and regional interests are important it makes a difference whether you're talking about land in the middle of the desert or you're talking about a rainforest but there's not that many companies that are using products that are coming from the desert so i'm not too worried no and that's very fair and i think that kind of goes back to that you know with pallets, for example, like the ones we have here, the amount of recycled, the amount of reusable materials that we have, so we prevent that extraction of virgin materials, prevent extraction from land to reduce that amount of energy that the planet has, the better it's going to be. It's also a question of using it the smartest way possible. Yeah. And I'm not sure this is the smartest way possible because oil and gas and coal, they're all based on plant products. Mm. But they're plant products that were made hundreds of thousands of years ago. We refine oil and get all sorts of exciting things out of it. What do we do with plant products today? Uh, there's tons of stuff yeah. in here that are interesting to be used for other things. We should be refining the biomass that we have, taking the fibers out, and then making your pallet. Um, but but you know we're we're yeah. not using these resources in the most efficient way possible. I think it's it's actually very interesting. And speaking of pallets, I was at a conference just a couple of weeks ago where there was a group that had come out with more innovative ways of creating pallets and speaking kind of to the same things on making sure that we extract the most out of the raw material first and then creating them almost as a natural byproduct of that. And so I know there are some people looking into it, so it might just be worth trying to see if we can expand on those or get involved in some of that work from our side. Someone asked, and I think it's a good question, I actually would want to ask the same one. You mentioned that we're removing about a third of the energy from our planet. And the question is, how else is waste impacting our planet and the planetary boundaries beyond that removal of energy? Well, that's actually not even a waste problem. That's just us <laughs> taking away the energy from there. But how is waste impacting? Well, we have, we have waste in terms of, much of it is chemical waste. Some of it is chemical waste that, you know, it's, it's, it's things that were here before, like CO2, or nitrogen or phosphorus, reactive nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, but we've messed up the, the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles more than we've messed up the CO2 cycle or the carbon cycle, uh, the global carbon cycle. And, and you know we forget the fact that we're a part of a system. And when the earth went from ice ages to non-ice ages, it moved 80 parts per million CO2 from the ocean to the atmosphere or the other way around. It took 80,000 years. Think what a huge change it had for the conditions on Earth. In the last 300 years, we humans have moved not 80, but 130 parts per million of CO2, of, of reactive carbon, CO2, not from the ocean, but from, the, from under Earth to, to the atmosphere. Whoa! It's going to be a long time before things come into balance. So we don't know totally the effects of all of the waste that we're putting out there. Particles in the atmosphere, well, we can be, um, if, we, if we get the balance, according to, uh, we believe from the planet, our analysis for the planetary boundaries, mm. if we have aerosols, the ratio of aerosols in the atmosphere, how clear is the air in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, if we change that ratio too much, we start moving around monsoons, which is not a good thing. There's a lot of people that depend on and live very close to monsoons. So, so what's happening with all the waste out there? Of course, we focus a lot on the, on the litter, on the plastic. So waste is, think, waste is things that don't belong in the earth system and wouldn't be there if if we weren't here and and we're we're um we're pay playing roulette with with this we don't know the effects a lot of it's probably pretty innocuous but um 
but not all of a it. A lot of it isn't. Yeah. You actually answered another question we'd gotten on the definition of waste. And so I think that something that is there, if not for us, or that wouldn't be there, if not for us, is a, a good broad way of defining what waste is. And as you mentioned, I think the, the microplastics, I've heard studies that, you know, babies are born with it in their bloodstream as well, that this is really something that is becoming so broadly impacting and without us knowing what the real impact is, that's a, it's a bit of a scary thought to sit with. But I wanted to just here in the end ask, with everything that we've talked about so far, if there's one message you want to leave with us, what would that message be? That would be, I can't imagine that humanity would be so unwise, so foolish as to not use the knowledge that we have about our relationship with the planet as a whole, because knowledge is power and we have the power to change this.